the times whenever we feel like that our prayers are just not getting through. There are times when I suppose everybody has had some depression and, and has had some discouragement and has found that, that I just don't feel like that my prayers are effective. I don't seem like you hear some people say, I don't feel like they're getting anywhere above the roof. I'm just not accomplishing those things. What is it? Well, let's start with brief review of the fact that last week we talked about prayer also. We talked about the issue of how do you pray when all else fails. We were looking specifically at an example on the part of Jesus. First, we saw that Jesus prayed often. We saw that he often went into the wilderness or to the mountains, that he went by himself alone into various places in order to pray. We saw that in major situations in his ministry, like the transfiguration, the appointing of the elders, and as he faced the crucifixion, that he always prayed. Prayer was a consistent, important part in the life of Jesus Christ. And he taught the disciples that they ought to pray. In fact, they taught each other, and they taught us that that ought to be the case. We have the time whenever Matthew records in the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, that Jesus said, when you pray, he's assuming that his disciples will pray. He didn't say, if you pray, he said, when you pray, pray say this, pray like this. And he gave what we commonly refer to as the Lord's Prayer. It was a model prayer for us. Luke chapter 11 starts out by talking about the fact that one of the disciples came to him when he'd been praying and said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Like John the Baptist, they didn't spell it all out, John taught his disciples to pray, would you teach us to pray? And so the way Luke records the so-called Lord's Prayer is, is right there. Whenever he said, would you teach us to pray? He gave the model prayer that is similar, at least, to the one in Matthew chapter 7, uh, also about how to pray. Uh, the business of praying is not so structured as it is from the heart. And it's not so do it at this one time or another but the scriptures teach that we ought always to be in communication with the Lord. That we ought always to be people who are giving credit and glory to God in everything. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, Paul said, Pray without ceasing, and all things give thanks to the Lord. Indeed, that's what we're seeking to do, is have that communication with God all the time. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another. Paul said in James, uh, James said in chapter 5 and verse 16 uh, of the book of James. So we're urged to pray. We have not uh, in this series, but in the book of Acts, as we've been studying on Sunday morning, we've noted from time to time how the early church was a praying church, that they were very, very often in prayer for all kinds of situations, whatever it was, whether it was for them to, to have the power and the strength that they needed to do the work that they were supposed to do, or if it was to deliver uh, Simon Peter from prison or whatever the situation was, they got together and they prayed to God about it. And Jesus, when he taught about prayer in John chapter 18, the scripture says that he taught the disciples that they ought always to pray and not to faint or to faint not. So the King James Version says. That all is that we ought to always be in a prayerful mood. It would be, I suppose, literally impossible to be constantly in prayer, dedicated prayer to the Lord. He's not saying that you don't ever have a conversation other than a prayer. He's saying always be in a prayerful mood. Keep prayer handy and let it be regular and often. And don't be a stranger uh, to God when it comes to calling on his name. Be someone that he will know because he's been hearing from you regularly 
even if he didn't have that consciousness of everyone that's in the world, he would at least recognize your voice because he's been hearing you talk to him on a regular basis. And Jesus gave a parable or an account at that point, and he said that uh, he, he used the example of a certain judge who was insensitive. Uh, unlike God, he didn't really care about people and their needs. Now, he's going to use the logic that God loves us. God wants what's best for us. That's a given. Just like a dad would want the best thing for his own children, for his family. It's a given that God wants the best for us. But this judge is, is altogether different. He doesn't care about other people and what they need. And so there was a certain widow that kept coming to her, to that judge, and asking for relief. I'm not sure who was oppressing her, how she was being oppressed. I, I'm not sure. It doesn't say what it was, but there was something that was heavy on her mind. And she kept coming and asking until finally Jesus said that judge who was uncaring became so tired of her coming and coming and coming that finally he said, give her what she wants. Her importunity is the word. Her consistent continuing and asking and asking and asking again. And Jesus said, if that uncaring judge ultimately responded to her request, how much quicker do you think God is going to respond to your request? You're his children. He wants to hear you. He wants to help you. He wants to answer our prayers. And so when we have that backdrop and that understanding of what prayer is supposed to be for us and that it is our ongoing daily process, but certainly is our tool in crisis as we even saw Jesus in prayer last week in his greatest crisis as he faced the cross. We need that tool to work for us, don't we? And I, I think, I have to confess, what, what I'm going to share with you tonight is not because of, or growing out of the, the fact that I have done a lot of uh, research in the field of neuroscience, that I understand what people are thinking and that I'm uh, like the psychiatrist or somebody who delves deeply into people's uh, psyche and ascertains what's going on and what dreams mean and all those kind of, it, it's not like that but rather it's a pragmatic situation that is a kind of a report of self-experience because we're not that different the guy that stands in the pulpit or behind the pulpit or wherever he stands is not all that different than the people who sit in the pew. We're all servants of the Lord, and we all got feet made of clay, and we all have the same kinds of needs, just maybe yours at one time and mine at another, but uh, there's, I think I mentioned to you before, there's some guys who, who write a blog now, and uh, their Sunday night blog that they address to all the people who are uh, their uh, subscribers is entitled, Don't Quit on Monday. <laughs> because sometimes preachers come out of Sunday, the Lord's Day, when they really ought to be the highest of all. When the brethren get together and we praise the Lord together, and we sing and pray and we see baptisms and we give to the Lord and all those kinds of things happen and fellowship happens, we ought to be the highest we could possibly be. But when you're in a situation that's not encouraging, it may turn out to be the lowest that you ever be. And they're saying, don't, don't quit on, on Monday. Give it a chance to get over that time when you might be discouraged and depressed and see the good side and go on some more. Well, preachers sometimes feel that they're not praying effectively like you may feel that you're not praying effectively. 
And so when I make these suggestions, they're not like commands, and they're not like I have all the answers to all the solutions and, and know, quote, how you feel, end of quote, in all those different circumstances. I don't. I don't even know what all you face. I don't even know what all you have in terms of, of coping mechanism to help you through. I don't know what your background is. I don't know how you hurt and what it is that causes you to hurt. And I'd have to be really, really inflated to think that I understand. But I do know that people reach the point where they feel like my prayers are just not effective. And so I try to approach the idea of why might that be? Why would we feel that our prayers are not effective. I think the first one I'll suggest would have biblical basis, but I'm not going to cite a verse about it. I think the first reason that I might come to think that my prayers are ineffective is my own self-image. I might not think that I am worth enough See, nobody knows me like I do. Nobody knows you like you do, individually. Paul said that, uh, well, I said I wouldn't use a verse, so I'll just not say where it is. Uh, Paul said that nobody knows the spirit of a man like but that man himself. Nobody could know us like we know ourselves. But when we know ourselves, we know our failures. We know our shortcomings. We know the things that we would rather not everybody else did know. And so when we start accumulating all of that knowledge about self, if we emphasize and accentuate the, the negative parts of it, we could start to get so we're not very pleased with ourselves. And then the next step in logic is, if I'm not pleased with myself, then God's not pleased with myself. And so if I appeal to him, he's not going to hear me anyway. My self-image. If I think I'm not worthy for God to listen to me, and I think I'm not so proud of myself, so I really hesitate to even enter into prayer because whenever I say, our Father who art in heaven, that's going to draw his attention right to me. And he's going to see my faults. My self-image might be a reason. Now, the scriptures say that I'm a son of God. You're a daughter of God, ladies. And I don't think there's any higher relationship that people have upon this earth than being sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty. He's our Father. He's the one who said, through the writer of the Hebrew letter, that we may boldly approach His throne, that we can come with confidence into His presence, not because we're so good, not because we're so important, but because we're His children. Our importance is in being sons and daughters of God. And our right to draw the attention of the ear of God rests not in how good we are, how special we are, but in who we are. We are his children. And fathers love their children and listen to them and want the best for them. And so self-image shouldn't keep me away from the presence of God. I have to understand that I'm saved by grace at best. And so it's not my self-worth, but I need to feel good about me because of my relationship with God. He's forgiven me. He's made, raised me up so I am his son. I need to feel good about me, but I can approach God in my weaker moments also, can't I? And you can, without apologizing that we're human Apologizing, yes, for our sins, but not for our humanness, because we all have that universally. And no other child of God's any different in that respect than we are. So it could be 
that we just start off not feeling good about ourselves, discounting ourselves and our importance to the Lord, and then that keeps us from being bold enough to approach Him or to have confidence in our prayer when we do pray. Second thing involves self also. It's kind of the other end of the scale. From not having a good self-image, the other side of the situation may be that an individual has not a poor self-image, but he's self-righteous. Now, the scriptures do teach that that's inappropriate. That one of the most effective ways that there is to cause a short, short circuit in our prayer life is self-righteousness. It may well be, ultimately, that more Christian people will miss heaven over self-righteousness than will over adultery because self-righteousness is so easy and it is so, so generally and, and socially tends to be acceptable when a person is so proud of himself or herself and we just get to thinking that we're the best thing that ever happened to this earth and God is sure lucky to have somebody like me. <laughs> it is humorous, isn't it, Paul? But there, the, the example Jesus used in Luke chapter 11, no, it's 18, isn't it, where he said there were two men went up to pray. And one of them was, uh, he, he was a man who, that, that really was uh, likely to, to not have much access to God, you'd think, and would have been looked down upon by the other one. And that one went in, and, and he just prayed, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And the other one came in and in his prayer, and you get the idea, maybe he prayed often. And he said, God, I, I thank you that I'm not like other men, you know, and not, not like this guy here. I'm, I, I thank you that I'm, I'm better than all of that. Pompous in the presence of God, self-inflated. And Jesus said, you want to know which one of those men went down to his house forgiven? It was a man who threw himself on the ground before God and confessed that he was a sinner, not the Pharisee, not the self-righteous one. And so humility has to be part of making prayer effective. It doesn't require self-degradation. It does not require a poor self-image, but it does not justify that pompous, high, and mighty self-righteous attitude that sometimes is gained. It is inappropriate. It's out of place in any aspect of Christianity including prayer, but not confined to prayer. It is inappropriate in any part of our Christian service to the Lord. Jesus made that pretty clear, I think, when the disciples were discussing who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. When they were arguing about who's going to be on the right hand and, right and the left hand of the Lord when he comes into his kingdom, Jesus said, whoa, you got it all wrong. In my kingdom, the greatest among you will be your servant, will be the one that is counted sometimes as the very lowest. So poor self-image could cause me not to pray or not to pray in faith, but self-righteousness just knocks it in the head to begin with, and it doesn't have a chance. It violates all the principles of humility that the Lord requires of us all the time. Now, I'm going to mention a moment ago that it might be that our faith becomes less. And the Lord says in James's writing that lack of faith can be something that hinders our prayer. He said, you, you ask and you receive not because you don't have the faith. You don't expect to receive it. 
Jesus encouraged his disciples to pray, and he promised them that if any man believes, if he asks for something, believing that he'll receive it, he will receive it. They can say to that mountain, be you moved hence, and it will be moved. You can do incredible things through prayer. That's not miracle working on our part. He's not talking about that. He's just talking about that prayer is very, very effective. In fact, he says that it hides a multitude of sins. It's, it's something that we need as a ready tool. Within our uh, tool bag of Christianity, we need prayer to be accessible. We need to have confidence in it. We need to have faith in the God who hears our prayer and the Jesus who transmits that to him and who gave his life and his blood so we have the right to approach his prayer. We need to be able to do that. And while the scripture speaks of us coming before him in fear and trembling, it means not in the sense of being unafraid to call his name, but being aware of how awesome he is. And that, except for the grace of God, we wouldn't belong there. But by the grace of God, we are appropriate in the throne room of God, approaching Him with our request. And, you know, if we ask something that God doesn't want to do, we're not going to influence Him to do something wrong. If we're, we're wrong and we ask him for a wrong thing, we're not going to change and make God do something wrong. We don't have to apologize that we're afraid to ask God for that because he will do the sifting and he will do the separating and he will do the answering and sometimes the answer will be no, but the no will be justified. The fact that I ask for something and God sees that that's not ultimately the best thing and does not grant it does not mean that I've been rejected. It means that a concept that I had was inappropriate and God ruled by not granting it. But I don't have to lose confidence in my prayer. If something's turned down and a thousand things are granted, I believe I'm more than conquerors in my prayer life too because the Lord grants so much and we have so much access to Him. But that self-righteousness, that lack of prayer, our faith in our prayers can help us. Now Jesus said something that must not be overlooked. When He talked about praying, uh, one of the things He said was, you pray to God saying, Father, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive those who trespass against us. If we are not forgiving, then there's a quality involved in that prayer that's missing. And interestingly enough, in all of the model prayer, when God uh, said, you say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you said, give us uh, this day our daily bread. When all those things, he, he doesn't give a commentary on it. But after he's finished the model prayer, he gives a commentary on this part where he says, for if you will not forgive your debtors or the people who sin against you, Neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. You see, lack of forgiveness on my part for other people will hinder my prayer. It'll cause it not to be effective because it's a contingency that if I'm going to be forgiven, I must first forgive. I must be a forgiving person in order to get forgiveness as a Christian in answer to my prayers. And if you've got in your heart and you know that you've got a grudge against someone else if there's someone who has, in fact, has wronged you, but you can't forgive it. Sometimes people say, well, you can't forgive unless they apologize. I think somebody made that up. There's nothing in Scripture that says they must apologize in order for you to forgive. It just says, unless you 
forgive. And if I've got grudges and spite in my mind toward a fellow human being, and if I could add, especially a Christian, then the Lord says, you don't have the right to forgiveness. And so you won't get it. What a thing to jeopardize. Forgiveness. What a thing to take a chance with. And for somebody's menial human offense, we would risk our very soul and keep on hating and, and being unwilling to forgive their wrong. That's a messed up, mixed up imbalance, isn't it? We're going to lose a whole lot more by that than we could ever conceivably gain. And so it might be that we can't get forgiveness because we want first give forgiveness. That, that would make your prayer ineffective. And that's, of course, something we each individually would have to work on. But we need to forgive. It's clear that we have to forgive in order to be forgiven. And the last thing I'll mention that would interfere with prayer being effective is pretty much a kindred to, to that unforgiving spirit, and that's bitterness. It, a person going before the sweet God of heaven, who is an always good and is forgiving and loving and kind, a person with a bitter heart going into the presence of such a person, such a one, God himself, is out of place. Bitterness destroys so very much. In fact, when the apostle, I, I almost gave credit there, and I need to, when the writer of Hebrews goes through all of chapter 11 of the great uh, the catalog of faithful people in Old Testament times and speaks of how their faith saved them, got them through. Ultimately, he says, if you really need an example, look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross because of the joy that set before him. Now he's right, sat down at the right hand of God and he urges us to keep on and keep on and not lose our faith and not go back. And finally, in verse 15 of chapter 12, he says, And let no root of bitterness spring up, for by it the many will be condemned. The only thing that can overcome us as long as we have faith and trust in the Lord, the only thing that, can, that is called out in Scripture as being like cancer to the soul is bitterness. That mean-spirited, critical, can't see the good side of anything, holding grudges and trying to spitefully get even with people and just being ugly inside out. He said that's the thing that will infect other people and many will be lost because of it. And you just can't imagine a bitter person coming into the throne room of God and starting to complain and bicker about everything that God's saying, oh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> you're so pleasant. <laughs> we always enjoy having you come in prayer. <laughs> no. Bitterness gets in the way of our prayer life. The secret for us all, not only for prayer life, but for life, is to be sweet, be kind, be like Jesus. Stay in touch with God. Don't ever, don't ever jeopardize. Don't risk jeopardizing the opportunity to say, my Father, please hear us when we call and know that He does hear and that He has the power to change the world 
and he wants the best for us. If you feel like your prayer life has been ineffective, examine it in these ways. These are not the only ways. I'm confident they are not, but they're ones that occurred to me when someone said, why do I feel like my prayers just aren't getting any attention or they're not getting it past the roof, as people often say. These are things that make sense to me and seem to be parallel enough with plenty of scriptures to seem to be true. But one of the solutions that we can offer in closing tonight is that if you do feel like your life, your, your prayer life has been ineffective, if you do realize there's sin in my life that I'm holding on to, that's, 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 that's what's causing the short circuit, is I haven't repented of it, I haven't acknowledged it, and it's standing there, and my conscience is hurting, and my self-image can't be good as long as I'm condemning myself, then that's what James was talking about when he said in 516, confess your faults one to another. Pray you one for another. And he promised, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The elders will pray for you. And we'll counsel with you and encourage you and try to teach you better if you want us to, because we love you. God loves you. And if you're separated from the Lord, we want to help you to be reunited and reconciled with him. Or if you're one who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, then, of course, you need to become part of his family so that you can indeed spiritually say, My Father, who art in heaven, because you've repented of sin as a believer in Jesus. You've confessed his name and been buried with him in baptism, and his blood has washed you clean. And now you become one of the sons or daughters of the Lord God Almighty who says, I want to hear you. I want to help you. I want to save you. And you become one with the redeemed. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus in any way, we invite you to come right now while we stand and sing.